Dino, you know, I would be very pleased if you could finally explain to me the difference between the professional qualifications and academic degrees. Yeah, that's a, that's a classic question. And everyone, I think, uh, is getting a little bit more aware of what a professional degree is or a professional title compared to an academic qualification or an, an academic designation. The, the difference is universities versus associations. Okay, so when you go to a university, you usually uh, do t a lot of theory. You learn a discipline, of course, you don't quite well, but you don't really know it in practice. And that's where the professional designation comes in, because it's more practical, it's more corporate, it's more on what's going on uh, in the corporation, especially when we talk about qualifications like ACCA, CIMA, CIA, all these qualifications. So the academic degree is usually the foundation. That's the way I want to see it. It's a bit more theoretical. It's the backbone. It's a foundation. It's a very useful, of course, uh, to have. Uh, and the professional qualification, you know, sets you apart, gives you something extra, differentiates you in, uh, in, in, in your field, whether it's a project management qualification or something else. So this is more practical. This is more theoretical. And that's the big distinction. That's why companies are actually trying to, uh, when they recruit graduates from the universities they want them to do qualifications because it keeps them it keep, it, it gets them into the corporate world easier more practical and because of the fact that the qualification has continuing development credits it actually keeps you up to date with what's going on where the academic degree uh, doesn't doesn't do that could you please give me the key trends of what's going to happen with the professional qualifications within the next few years? That might be industry-wise or delivery-wise. What's, what's happening is that we're seeing, we're, we're coming into an era of hyper-specialization. Uh, everything, everything that people are doing these days is, is changing rapidly. So you, you cannot be, of course, an, an expert in, in just one thing. So we, we're, we are becoming hyper-specialists. And that, that's the work by Tom Alone from MIT, which I, I really uh, admire. Uh, and, and I kind of agree with him that we are becoming more hyper-specialists. People need to have a portfolio of specialist areas that they're, that, that they're good at. So I think the more we move into this fast-paced, changing world that everyone's talking about, and of course we all agree, uh, this disruptive world where, where people are, can only make a plan for about six months or a year. Uh, we don't know what we need to do. We always have to be uh, aware of the current trends. And the only way to keep up to date in terms of employment and qualifications is to do what I call real-time career management. So at every certain point in time, you say, oh yeah, what, what's going on now? You know, should I know more about data analytics like people are doing right now? Yes, you should know more about data analytics. Should I know more about how to visualize data analytics? Yes, you, yes, you should. Uh, our programming, you know, as, as we say, people need to do, to do a little bit more or know more about programming, not to become experts necessarily, but to understand what's going on. Know more about big data. Uh, know more about innovation, creative thinking and disruption. So, and these things, are skills in many cases and, you, and there are knowledge areas so it's important for someone to keep on going because things change and maybe you know we've talked about this on, on, on a number of occasions and, and and I know you you kind of agree on this that uh, it's a it's a it's a long lasting process until until we, 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 we leave this world you just have to keep on going so so my answer would be we're becoming more specialists we need to up to date our knowledge every every now and then and usually it's about 18 months to 2 years that's that's the norm now it may become less so every one or two years one and a half or two years you need to update your knowledge and the other important thing is that the only way to do that to kind of update is probably get certified in it don't say i just know it but i can show you the proof that i'm certified in this and that's that's very powerful if you go to a company say okay here it is i'm certified in this uh, in agility and agile systems or something or adaptability or have to have digital literacy all these things are becoming much more powerful as skills to keep on being employable which i think is a very important word uh, word staying employable you know people need to be employable their whole life i would like to ask you whether one of the key points strong points is the continued professional development that these pro professional qualifications offer within um, a student that joins into the program. Yes, that, that is, I think, the, one of the key differentiators because the fact that you are certified as an ACCA, for example, or as a CIMA, 
uh, qualified uh, person that to keep on continuing to use that designation you need to update your knowledge and the association should know that like or becoming an, a, an, an HR professional through SHRM to keep the designation you have to update your knowledge and that's a differentiator it's the only way to keep up to par and I think HR offices around the world will know more and more about that which means that if you want to get recruited to a company, they could check you out immediately if you are up to date. They would have like an like a extra net system that they would check Anthony if, if you are certified and you are up to date. And that could give you the job or not. Because you talked about a number of professional qualifications and designations, for example, ACCA, CIMA, um, and as far as I know, both of them, they are for finance professionals and accounting professionals. Why would you say why there are so many and why they are different? There, they are, there are many, but the, the ones that really count are like you know, what you just uh, mentioned, the ACCA, ICAW, CIMA. In terms of the accounting and finance people, the CPA, of course, from, from, from the USA, uh, there's four or five, maximum six of the accounting and finance. The, the reason we have many of them is because different jurisdictions, different you know, different history. You know, there's, there, there, there was a one CPA was it was an American one. The ACCA was more British, then it became a bit more international. So there's a big history behind that. So and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, competition makes you better. They're, they're, all, they're all global qualifications. But the difference in in a couple of a couple of ways. I mean, CIMA is different than ACCA in the sense that CIMA is for management accountancy. Chartered Institute of Management Accountants. Uh, the ACCA is more for accountants and auditors, and that's why they 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 like to do that qualification. Uh, ICW also auditing, and historically that was you know one of the, the most well known, uh, but also uh, accounting and, and also finance elements. I think all of them are becoming quite close in terms of you know they're changing the curriculums because everything is interrelated. You cannot be an accountant if you don't know finance. If you cannot do finance, you don't know accounting. So that's why all of them are kind of similar in, 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 in the feel, but there are differences. I, I don't think the people, of course, uh, it, it wouldn't really matter. I'll be honest with you. People say, oh, should I do this one or that one? I mean, they're all great qualifications. And they're all, they're all going to give you, you know, a, a, a differentiating proposition if you go to a company because they're powerful, uh, they're, 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 they're practical in, in nature, they're, they're professional qualifications, as we said, so they are, you know, simulating the workplace. They do teach you up-to-date trends in accounting, finance, and all these elements. Uh, they have a different way of being examined. That's fine. But they're getting better and better. The ACCA, for example, as you know, has uh, now a case study at the end. SEMA already had case studies, but they're a different weighting in terms of how, the, how, they, how they actually assess them. The ICAW also had a case, of course, at the end, and not only. So they're, they're, they're getting better and better, all of them. They're not really, really different. I mean, it wouldn't, you know, if you go, to, let's say, to a company like PwC or Deloitte or the, the, the big players, any one of these could probably open up a door. So it's not, you know, maybe they would want more, maybe not auditing, but I think now people are getting into more advice. So maybe SEMA and ACA could, could fill that gap. So just to, to give you a clear answer, if I, if I may, uh, they're, they're similar, they're powerful, they're great. It doesn't really matter which one you, 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 you do uh, in a good sense. And I know that I know, you know, we, we can we can clarify that. I don't want to act as if everything is the same, but uh, they're, they're all very powerful. They're all in the finance and accounting and accounting world. Uh, it all depends on what you want to do. So when I speak to someone in my office and you said, hey, Anthony comes and says, Dino, I'm, I, I want to do this qualification. What do you think? I would ask you, and this, this is what people should get into more. It's what I do all my life with my brother, Jimmy. We always say, what, what do you want to do? I want to work for a company like Coca-Cola. I want to set up my own business. I want to, and based on the, you know, the vision and the mission of the person, we go back and say, okay, this is probably better for you. This is probably going to do this. The time, the exemptions, the policies. So it's a, it's a, it's a comp complex uh, issue. As you very well know, there is an issue of uh, protection, data protection and privacy issue within Europe, but yep. globally as well. All right. One lawyer could easily claim I can interpret right now the regulation and that's sufficient for me to assist companies in their task, task in terms of protecting the, the customer data, for example. Would you say a professional qualification could do a, a better job here? Would be able to help companies and employees to do the task more close to the regulation? I can see where you're getting at. I mean, I think what you're saying is actually, would someone get certified in the area of data privacy? Yes. And that, okay, okay. So people who do data privacy, you know, these days because of GDPR, 
are, are people that are in are in the legal profession and the IT profession. So a good combination would be law, IT systems, and understanding you know these two two disciplines. Uh, getting certified from let's say EAP, you know we offer the EAP qualification, the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Getting certified in that would probably give you the edge because it, you know there are not too many people that are certified these days. I don't think it's 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 more of a niche let's say area. There are not thousands of people getting certified every day. But a, a person who's a lawyer and, and lawyers didn't have a lot of qualifications to do. There are not too many options for lawyers. You know they they, they were in law. You know different types of law, but they were in law. They didn't have their own association in terms of doing qualifications like accounting finance. Does. So I think they would have a differentiating proposition or a, or, a, or a unique selling proposition for themselves if they do get certified in data privacy, purely for two reasons. One, the updated knowledge with the regulation, which is laid out and you get examined on it, which means that you have the benchmark to be certified in this. So that could open up doors for new positions like DPO, the, the data privacy officer. And the second thing is what we said earlier about being up to date to renew your qualification, which that would give someone the, the opportunity to prove that they're certified, they are up to date, and get them in a network of professionals on LinkedIn or you know, through the, the IAPP network to learn more of where it's going so they would have the capability, the knowledge to tell their company, you know, I heard of this, I read this, this is going to change. So the association would help them when they become members. How would you see compliance within an organization and maybe privacy or any other of uh, business areas that will fall into the compliance? Compliance actually is the other area where lawyers and people in compliance uh, who are usually with a legal background, but in some countries are accountants, basically, and financiers. But in, 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 our, in our, let's say, area here, closer to what we do in the, in, in, in the Balkan area, uh, plus the Middle East uh, and Central Eastern Europe, they're mostly people that are, that are legal. Uh, legal consultants or lawyers, and these people now have, a, have have the option to get into compliance. GDPR is a compliance area as well, so that's interesting. So you can do IAPP, you can do the International Compliance Association qualifications or something like that, and that could really help you differentiate. Again, they're more they're more geared towards governance and compliance, and the other one is more on data. So you can imagine that you can, after you do this, you can do that, but that's the only way to stay employable. You know, a lawyer, you know, a lawyer cannot just stay with the same thing they did years ago. They have to go on. It's impossible to be up to date. I mean, you know, you, you read something every day. We, we read, we, we, you know, we read more than ever. We, we never read as much as we do today. If, you, if every, anyone counts the amount of words we read from the Internet, from our laptops, everything, the attachments, the videos we see. If you think about it, we read more than ever. So you have to make sense of what's going on. It's very difficult to focus in one area. And these associations can probably help you move into different directions and give you that competitive advantage. Now, um, the last few years, as you're very well aware of, um, the role of the human resource departments have been um, extremely uh, strong. And they have a great influence uh, within their companies. Uh, why do you feel that HR plays uh, such an important role? And what one person that is interested to become an HR professional could do from now on and uh, onwards? Along the same lines, every discipline, as we say, you know, uh, has a professional qualification in most cases. So accountants have it, financiers. We, I, I didn't mention the CFA, I forgot. I mean, finance, uh, people in finance, to the, to the Chartered Financial uh, 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 Association uh, program, chart financial analysts. I'm sorry. So the the, the fi finance also has their own. Data privacy now has their own. HR should have their own qualification, and they do. You know, one of the most popular ones I'm certified in, and and, and uh, I know quite well is the SHRM, the American qualification, which of course now has over 110,000 I think uh, uh, certified people around the world in, in almost every country these days, and uh, it just shows you that that is becoming a more let's say in a certain way, regulated profession, if I can, if I can use that, that word, even though I like the word regulation in the sense that uh, for legal lawyers would, would think about it. But they also have their own you know, body of knowledge, and they also should have their own competency framework. You know, how could you become an HR person without understanding, let's say, business acumen, how to help out the strategy of the company, how, understanding recruitment, the different types of recruitment, the limitations of interviewing, all of these things. You, know, you must have a benchmark 
because you know there, there's a, there's associations around the world, there's universities, but you must have a benchmark, as I call it, of of of, of knowledge, and SHRM could could provide that to you. So you know we can, we can go on this forever, but every single discipline uh, has a certification, and this is over and above the academic qualification, and I think that's that's what that's that that's where I see where where we're going. I would like to stand what you just said over a, a, a normal qualification. The professional qualification right now, if you could categorize uh, in terms of like a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, where will, will, will it fall? Hmm. Will it be something higher okay. or less? Yeah, I, I, I get this, uh, this question a lot and uh, it depends on the qualification. And this is, this is one of the difficult things to understand if you're not in, in, in our industry. It's, you know, the word certification. What is it? The word designation. What's the difference? The word professional title, what is it? At what level are these? How equivalent are they? Well, example, ACCA, ICAW, CIMA, these types of qualifications are, are, are over bachelor's level. You know, they, they would go up to a master's equivalent. Okay, That's based on the level, the levels of the European Union, if you go and check these things out. So they're quite powerful, but let's say a two or three day designation. Uh, for example, project management professional is 40 hours. You know, I wouldn't put it at a bachelor's level, but I would put it as a pow very powerful professional qualification for people that do have a degree, number one, usually, because that people who do it have a degree, but they have work experience. So, uh, and something I think we, we didn't mention, and, and, and I think I should have earlier, you need to have work experience coupled with, with, with knowledge areas. And if you have both of these, then, uh, then that's, what, that's how you're certified. You cannot get into a qualification without having completed the, the work experience. Now, um, another question for our viewers right now. It's very simple, the duration in relation to professional qualifications, the normal degrees, how long does it take? And about the exams, is it easy, not easy? Well, is it by exams? Yes, Please. every 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 qualification uh, has has exams, uh, at least the ones that I'm I'm aware of and, and deal with and, and, and deliver. So there, there's there's usually a combination of exams, work experience, uh, in in the area of, you know, that, that, that you want to get certified in. For example, CIA, another, another qualification, internal audit. You need to have experience in the field for about three years. And, um, and then you take the exams, which is three parts right now. So if you finish the part successfully and you have the verification of your work experience, that duration would probably go for about a year, a year and a half for the three parts. Some people want to do it faster. They could. Would I advise them? No. That's a different mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. If you want to do the ACCA, you know, there's, there's 13 right now courses for ACCA, 13 papers. So, if, you know, can you finish them in two years? You probably can, but, you know, things happen. <laughs> We're disrupted in life, families, children. It's very difficult to, you know, put that on paper and, and follow that. So to give you, a, again, a clear answer, if I can, it all depends on the certification. The duration could be from, from two days, the shortest one, let's say 16 hours of training, if you count, count the days of training, like data privacy, for example, very specialist, very niche to the point, two or three days, to, to up to three years. For let's say something like CMI, say WACCA, depending on the way, the way, the way you follow and if you pass uh, in a fast way. So experience, exams, and durations vary. And that's why it's very important. I actually, I think I, I should mention this now. I, I, in in my, my latest book, uh, Are You Serious?, you should remember that the, the model I had, there was a, there was a model about duration, uh, and age, duration of a qualification and age, okay? And I, what I said is that, you know, I'm over 50 years old right now, so I would not spend time to do another three or four year qualification. I don't think it would be beneficial for employment experience or people accepting me or recognizing me in the market for who I am. But if you're young, you should spend time on a three or four year qualification. That's why they do a bachelor's when they're younger. So we should pick, if you're older, the duration of the program should be shorter. And if you're younger, the duration could be longer. Now, if a young person does a program of short duration, it's a benefit, but it's not a differentiator because it probably didn't have experience. And that's something that you know, I have as a norm when I speak to people. I got to know about their families. I got to know about their, you know, what they're doing. 
it's, it's very important to know about. I mean, you, if you come to me and say, Tino, I'm thinking about, I, I want to sit down. I want to I want to know your family, you know, your family, your, if you have children, how much time can you spend on it? We're, we're getting into more personalized attention to one to one. You can't just say, oh, here's a supermarket and you know, do a qualification. It Does, doesn't work that way. You know, that's another thing that bothers a number of, of potential students for professional qualifications is the role of exceptions because as you very well know some they have a, a, a normal bachelor's degree, they have a master's degree and then they, they prefer to follow a professional qualification route. What happens with the exceptions there? Is there something and obviously will depending on a number of institutions but is something happening there? Yeah, yeah. The exemptions are given only to, I would say, the longer duration qualifications, like ACCA, like the CIMA, uh, like the ICAW. Uh, it all depends on what you've done. So usually what these associations do is they say, okay, you have a bachelor's degree in accounting and finance. That's relevant to my qualification. So you are exempt from two, three, four, five, you know, courses out of 13, 14, depending on how many they are for each one. That, that is happening and, and there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, there, is, there is a debate among some people saying that you should not even accept the exemption sometimes. Why? Because you don't go through the whole program and being an exempt doesn't necessarily prove that you know what you're being exempt on because every university is different. And that's, that's a problem you know, that, that, that we're, we're going through. But overall exemptions are okay. You could be exempt even from one third of a course. Uh, there's a great quali a great opportunity to do, let's say, something like the CIMA CFO, uh, that I'm not sure you heard of, the CIMA, which is addressed only for CFOs, high-level people, directors, or even CEOs of companies, and they respect the fact that they have like 10, 15 years in the business, and they're exempt on you know most of it. But that's those, that, those, that's unique. It's not something that happens uh, you know every, every day. There's, there's, there's also there's unique qualifications or unique exemption policies. And that, there's nothing wrong with that, as long as you know, people do know what they're exempt on. I am uh, 25 years old, I just finished a degree, yep. and I come to you and I say, I would like to become a certified accountant. What should I do? Well, if you, if you want to get into accountancy, the options we mentioned earlier are, are, are excellent. I mean, the big four, PwC, Deloitte, KPMG, and EY, uh, among others, and, and of course other, other, other companies like Mazars or, or, or Grant Thornton, BDO, the, the big players in the act, they all recruit people who are certified and they, or they will pay for your certification. So they, they, they would probably want it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's why you know, a lot of big companies have, have academies these days because they, they, they filter them through their own academies in many cases. Um, so I would, I would advise them of course to, to try to find a way to work at the same time and do the qualification. I think these days that's the best way to do it because you need experience anyway. How can you get certified if you don't have the experience? So I would advise them to, to find a job. I know that's difficult, but you know, but it, and if they can't do that, I would start on my own. You've got to believe in yourself. You can't wait for others. Never mm -hmm. complain. Mm -hmm. Just do, do, do what you mm -hmm. have to do. So I would advise them to start something. Because then if they, they can strengthen their CV by saying, I already started it, I'm on the fifth course. So if you recruit me, I only have a few. So it's a cheaper way to get in for the company. This guy, you know, Anthony has five courses done already. So I would advise them to start in any case because it is a differentiator in the market. Uh, and even people who have one or two academic degrees still need a qualification in the accountancy area, which is interesting because you may have like a PhD in accounting, but who needs a PhD in accounting? I think if you think about it. So in essence, a master's degree or a professional qualification? Yeah, oh, don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, you know, I'm an educator and you, you need, of course, the higher you go, the better. And you know, I don't want to be misunderstood here. But if you ask the companies, they want, sub, they want practitioners. It, learning is not doing. Learning is different than doing. So doing is what you need to do. And practical cases and questions are done through qualifications usually, not academia. I'll give you an example, cash flow statement. You, you, can, you can go to a college or university and they will teach you the different types of cash flows, uh, for example, you know, and then tell me how many types of cash flow you know, systems do we have. But if you go to do a, a question on ACCA, on, in a practical sense, you have to do the cash flow. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different, different thing to do. You know, suggest and recommend what to do, not just in theory, in theory say how many ways we have. And I'm not saying that every university does that. Don't, you know, there's no one size fits all here. Some universities go into the practice and it all depends on the trainer. But in one case, it depends on the university and the trainer and the educator, and in the other one, it's a fact.
Now looking into the future once again, um, okay, the professional qualification is a professional qualification, but there are so many different methods of delivery out there. So you see that there are online practice programs, they're blended, they are just classroom-based. Excellent point, What's yeah. What's your point? We're, we're discussing this all the time with uh, fellow trainers and you know, people in, in my area. Well, there, for, again, some people like online, some people like face-to-face. In America, a couple of years ago, I think it was 17 or 18, there was a study by the Talent Development Association said that 49% of, of, uh, of training is still done face-to-face, which means that people still like face-to-face, even in this day and age of disruption and online learning. Now, if you, if, if you ask clients that, that we have, they still want to listen to me in a classroom. They, they like the videos, but they also like me, you know, being in a classroom. It's more, it's more dynamic. It's, it has a lot more activities, you know, learn from others in, in, the, in, the, in the class itself. You know, one thing leads to another. The, the first point is that I think we're moving into a blended approach in many qualifications. I'm not saying in everything, in many qualifications, because, again, it, it's very complex as a question. But I, I think people will be looking a lot more into online mediums, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that if, if you're disciplined. There's nothing mm-hmm. wrong if you're mm-hmm. disciplined, but they also would mm-hmm. need, let's say, a couple of days of training with someone like myself or a trainer who would probably give you some tips and tricks and maybe, you know, elaborate more on an, on, on an ongoing question and a clarification to go a little bit more into depth. So I would, I would suggest you need a, you need a more, you more, you know, more, a more, a, an approach would probably be a little bit more blended. The other point is that the amount of hours, people always say, oh, this, uh, I hear this all the time, this, this company is offering 100 hours of something, you know, universities offer 200 hours of something, mm-hmm. and well, sorry to say that, you know, I can, I can probably pass you with 40 hours in my course, or 50, or even 60 when other people do 100. So you have to know your course inside out to, to deliver. Mm-hmm. You know, students should not make the mistake that this is only five hours, this is 10 hours. Of course, you can't just offer a couple of hours, but I'm just saying quantity is not the same as quality. We know that. Um, and, and they have to make sure it's all about the trainer. It's all about the, you know, the way, the methodology of training. That's what counts. So blended approach, number one, uh, face-to-face and online, 60, 40, 40, 60, doesn't really matter. We are moving online, but you know, the face-to-face always really is really helpful, maybe for a day or two. And then moving into the hours, don't, the students should not judge. If they go online, they see something for 10 hours, it may be, it may be excellent. You know, I've seen a TED Talk in six minutes. You know, so the, there's a leadership story in two minutes. Say, wow, that's very powerful. So it all depends. We shouldn't mm-hmm. just judge the time. Because we spoke about the professional qualifications, I would be very interesting to see your point of view in relation to professional training. For example, soft skills. What's your point on it? Soft skills are the new hard skills. That's what I always say. And um, if, you, if you look at all the, all the research studies, they all say that the new you know, hard skill or the difficult skill in that sense, you know, not using a, the same definition for hard, is actually having the ability to communicate, to handle meetings, to negotiate better, to do good presentations, to be able to do public speaking. These are the skills that actually make you stay at a company. People think they, you know, they, they get in the company, of course, with a degree and their qualifications, but what makes you stay is competencies, these types of skills. And that's why you, people are being appraised on these things. They don't, they don't ask someone, for example, uh, after five years of employment, or do they have a degree? It's, it's, it's a given, you know, we, we did that. Are they qualified? Yeah, okay, they're still qualified. They do have that. So are they working good with teams? Are they, are, are, are they, are they inspiring others? Are they, are they managing and leading well? You know, how they do, do, they, do they contribute to the culture of the company? All these things have to do with communication skills. Time management, managing, managing time is probably, for me, one of the probably top two or three skills in the world these days because of the many time wasters we have. And what's going on with Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn, you know, there's 14 different ways to communicate with me right now. I, I counted them once, you know, from Skype and Viber and emails and SMS. If you count them all, you need like one hour of your time just to check your, you know, your friends and your family. Uh, so if, if you, and colleagues that have groups in that sense. So that's another amazing skill. So to, to, to be clear, uh, soft is the new hard, and that's why people stay. I mean, if, if someone likes someone at employment or they meet someone, they meet and they meet and they impress because of the skill, what, they, what, what type of vibe they give out. They don't say, oh, tell me what you studied in. You know, after a certain point in time in your life, no one asks you that. 
People don't know what I studied, for example. And then they go check, oh, this guy has a degree in that, but it, that, that's over and above. They would like Dino for Dino, they would like Anthony for Anthony, for what, you, what, what comes out of you. So, and th this is all softer skill. This is all being able to portray who you are and have the, you know, the accountability, the integrity. These, these are also important aspects of, of someone. So soft, soft is crucial. We're getting a lot of calls, by the way, uh, for soft skills. A lot of companies are spending more time and I think, uh, I think they, they know that they're crucial. And uh, in relation to the soft skills again, how they're delivered? How do you see people asking to acquire these skills uh, that's, online? That's, that's mostly face-to-face. -face. And the reason is that you cannot do you know, an activity. Uh, you, know, you, you need to be close to someone, you know, work with someone like you do in an office. Even though, yes, I know we're not going to have offices in, in, in the future, people will still meet. People will still have to meet each other. They do have to understand soft skills in, 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 a, in a video setting. You know, there's also so how, to, how to even you know, have a stance, how to speak. Uh, how to make sure you know you don't uh, uh, interrupt people. Be a good listener. You know, these are all skills. And uh, as I say, you know, degrees get you in the door, but competencies make you stay. Excellent. Thank you very much for the great interview and the advice you give to our viewers here. Thank you, Thank you very much. And hopefully, we'll speak again um, about some other related issues to the professional qualifications. Thank you, Anthony. My pleasure. Very soon.